Imagine we were on a trading ship setting out from Europe bound for Asia sometime in the 17th century. The boundaries of the known world are expanding faster than ever, and it's an exciting time to be alive. Well, if we can stay alive. Travel is difficult, dangerous, and many ships never make it home. Luckily, our ship is carrying the latest invention that improves our odds. It's not new medicine or new kind of sail or anything that even looks like new technology. It's a little book of logarithms, and it's going to save the lives of everyone on board. Actually, is it just me, or do there seem to be a lot of watery graves in this algebra class? Ahoy, mateys. I'm James Tanton, and this is Study Hall Algebra, presented by Arizona State University and Crash Course. When 17th century explorers used trigonometry, which is all about the relationships between triangles, and the stars to navigate at sea, they needed to do many long and complicated multiplications, and they needed to do them fast so they didn't wreck their ships on the rocks or get lost in dive scurvy. Trade and navigation were big business, so mathematicians around the globe were trying to find ways to speed up the calculations, like by turning multiplication into addition. But this transfiguration proved harder than it might sound, and it sounds pretty hard. And some came close, but it took until 1614 for the mathematician John Napier to publish his revolutionary work. And so the logarithm was born. Napier was actually thinking about ratios and particles moving away from each other, and created the word logarithm by combining the Greek words for ratio and number. It took over a century for the famous mathematician Leonard Euler to figure out that Napier was really describing the behavior of exponents and powers, which is how we think about logarithms today. A logarithm is a power that some fixed number, called the base, must be raised to in order to get a given result. For example, log base 10 of 100,000 is the power of 10 that gives 100,000, and log base 2 of 8 is the power of 2 that gives the answer 8. The base of a logarithm can be most any number, but there are a few that we rely on more than others. For instance, the log key on your calculator is actually base 10, which is called the common logarithm, and is used most often since we like to think about powers of 10. If you see a logarithm and there's no base specified, that means it's a common logarithm. The Richter scale, used to describe the strength of earthquakes, is built on common logarithms. A quake of magnitude 6 has seismic waves with amplitudes in the millions of units. The Richter scale takes the log of the amplitude of the waves, which means for each step up the scale, the strength increases by a whole power of 10. Like scientific notation, logarithms help us reframe really big numbers and their growth. And their creation didn't just save the lives of explorers, it opened the door for vast achievements in science. Today, we type everything from basic arithmetic to complicated integrals into a calculator. But there was a time when scientists could fill pages and pages with calculations and still not make progress. Imagine trying to model the solar system with only a pencil and paper. Yeesh. Logarithms can help anyone with long multiplication. When we're multiplying two things together, if we take the log, we can split up that multiplication, add the log of the first thing to the log of the second thing, and voila, multiplication turns into addition. If we think about logarithms as powers, and remember x to the a times x to the b is x to the a plus b, this isn't that surprising. And we can do an example just to be sure. Our rule says the log base 2 of 4 times 8 equals log base 2 of 4 plus log base 2 of 8. On one side, we have 4 times 8 is 32. So log base 2 of 32 is asking what power of 2 equals 32? Well, 4 is 2 squared and 8 is 2 cubed, so 32 is 2 to the 2 plus 3, the fifth power. On the other side, these terms are asking what power of 2 equals 4 and what power of 2 equals 8? And again, we have 2 plus 3 equals 5. And if we remember that x to the a divided by x to the b equals x to the a minus b, it's not that surprising to learn that we can turn division into subtraction like this. So, if we have log base 3 of 27 over 9, we can rewrite it as log base 3 of 27 minus log base 3 of 9. On the left, we're asking what power of 3 equals 3, which is just 1. On the right, we're asking what power of 3 is 27 minus what power of 3 is 9. 3 minus 2 also equals 1. Trying to accurately model patterns around us has driven much of mathematics and science forward. And over the centuries, we've learned that lots of complicated phenomena, like population changes or financial interest rates, can be described with exponential equations. These equations have variables as the exponents. But think about it. If we had something like 5 to the xth power equals 31, we wouldn't be able to solve that precisely without logarithms. Now, we might just guess that x is a little more than 2, but much less than 3, since 5 to the second power is 25, and 5 to the third power is 125. So to work with this problem, let's remember the exponent rule about stacking powers and use some logarithms. If we had log of 10 squared, we're asking what power should we raise 10 to in order to get 10 squared? And that's 2. So in general, if m equals 10 to the b, then log of m is b. We keep all the same pieces, we're just using a different way to say the same thing. But then, let's take it all one step further and stack some powers. If we take m to the k, that's just 10 to the b or to the k which is equal to 10 to the b times k. So log of m to the k is just log of 10 to the b times k, which is equal to b times k. 
since we're asking what power 10 gives 10 to the b times k. Then we can rewrite b as log of m to get k times log of m, and our rule. We can take down any power inside a logarithm and multiply it in front. We've worked with common logs here, but the same is true for any base. So let's hit 5 to the x power equals 31 with a log on both sides to get x times log of 5 equals log of 31. Divide both sides by log of 5, and this leaves us with x equals log of 31 divided by log of 5. Now that looks pretty convoluted, but it is precise. By guessing and checking, you might get that x is about 2.13, but log of 31 over log of 5 is the exact form. The same way the square root of 2 is the exact form, and 1.41 is an approximation. So in general, we've just seen that log base a of a to the x is x, and we can use a logarithm to undo an exponent. So does this work the other way around? Can exponents undo logarithms? So we want something like a raised to the power of log base a of x to be just x. And thinking about powers, this actually makes sense if the bases match. Log base a of x is the power of a that gives the answer x. So if I plug it in as my power of a, I will get the answer x. And to round out our important logarithm properties, notice two things. Log base a of a equals 1 for all values a. Because this logarithm is really just asking what power of a gives the answer a, and that power is 1. a to the 1 is a. And similarly, log base a of 1 equals 0 for all values of a, because anything raised to the power of 0 is 1. There's one more special type of logarithm that gets its own name, the natural log. That's a logarithm with base e the irrational number, which is approximately equal to 2.718. So why does a logarithm built on e get a special name? As we notice more math around us, e keeps popping up, like it's somehow hard-coded into the universe. But actually, e shows up so much because we choose to use it. When something like bacterial growth is doubling and described by an exponential equation like 2 to the x, scientists discovered that its growth rate was equal to about 0.693 times the population size, which is an awkward number. Growth based on tripling, or 3 to the x, had a growth rate of 1.099 times the population size, another awkward number. So logically, there must be something between 2 and 3 where the growth rate of the exponential equation is just 1 times the population size. And after much searching, it turns out e is the number that makes the mathematics of exponential equations just the easiest. And to get a sense of just how prevalent this number e is, let's look at the world through our x, y, and e-ray vision. Through the math goggles, we can see e is absolutely everywhere. The changes in height of sunflowers growing in the garden, the amount of heat lost by pie cooling on a windowsill, the amount of interest accumulating in a savings account, and everything that contains radioactive isotopes, like nuclear reactors, amoebas, mathematicians, and stars, and dead stuff. In fact, measuring the amount of radioactive carbon-14 isotopes is called carbon dating, and it's used to establish the age of very old artifacts. In any living organism, the ratio of carbon-14 to ordinary carbon is about constant. But once something is dead and no longer taking in carbon, the amount of carbon-14 decreases exponentially. And we don't just mean really fast. It actually decreases proportional to its starting point. The model for this process typically looks like this. The amount of carbon at some time t is equal to the initial amount of carbon times e raised to the rate of decay multiplied by t. Let's say we've found an old-looking piece of intricately carved wood in a cave. And we find its carbon-14 ratio is about 45% of that in living wood. So our current carbon is 45 hundredths, or 0.45 but the initial carbon was 100 one hundredths at the time the wood was cut, or just one. And scientists have found that the rate of decay, or decrease, of carbon-14 is approximately negative 0.0001216. Plugging everything in our equation looks like 0.45 equals e to the negative 0.0001216 times t. If we get time out of the exponent and solve, we'd have a pretty solid guess on how old this artifact is. So let's hit it with a natural log. The log and e cancel out since log base a of a is 1 for any number a. So solving for time t gives us log of 0.45 over negative 0.0001216. If we calculate that, we get approximately 6,566.7 years. Whoa, we need to talk to Indiana Jones about this thing. Logarithms sound mysterious, but they are incredibly powerful tools, and they always have been. But they definitely look confusing. So if you're stuck, here's what you can do. If you want to pull a variable down to Earth and take it out of an exponent, hit it with a logarithm. If you want to get rid of a logarithm, exponentiate using the same base. And if you're modeling growth or decay, you're probably going to use e. If you're describing something in orders of magnitude, you're probably going to use log base 10. If there's no logarithm in your equation before you introduce one, you can use any base you like. So we've expanded our range quite a lot since our first video. We've gone from counting to finding new types of numbers to turning multiplication into addition and somehow not breaking everything along the way. There's always more math to learn. Next time, we'll look at polynomials and imaginary numbers, the next puzzle piece to the story of algebra. So until then, 
Cheers. Thanks for watching Study Hall Algebra, which is produced by Arizona State University and the Crash Course team at Complexly. If you like this video and want to keep learning with us here at Study Hall, be sure to subscribe. You can learn more about ASU and the videos produced by Crash Course in the links in the description. See you next time.